Before my youngest daughter, Charlotte, was born, she was already incredibly different from her typically developing big sister. In the womb, she was always quiet, never kicking me or performing acrobatics. She was so still at the end of my pregnancy, I went to the clinic to get checked because I was worried we'd lost her. Charlotte arrived a week late, and she was so content, the doctor told me I needed to wake her up more regularly for feedings. My husband and I counted our blessings, thinking we'd gotten lucky to have such an easy baby. In January 2017, at her six-month visit with a pediatrician, the doctor noted Charlotte wasn't meeting some of her milestones. She recommended we have her evaluated by our county's Infants and Toddlers Program, which provides early intervention service to assist families in addressing children's developmental and special needs. In addition to developmental delays, Char's muscles were floppy, and other symptoms in her growth and features increasingly signaled something was wrong. It took months to get an appointment. In mid-2017, when Charlotte was just a year old, evaluators came to our house. I told them nothing was wrong. Charlotte was just the opposite of her big sister. She was lazy. I'll never forget the evaluator looking at me, her body rigid, when she said, she's not lazy, there's something wrong. When it hit me, the realization I'd been hiding from for months, I burst into tears. After the evaluation, we were referred to the specialists at Children's National Hospital here in DC, who did their best to connect us with services to address Char's extreme global developmental delay. We needed physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and more recently, behavioral therapy. Now five years old, Charlotte remains at the bottom 1% of every developmental test, and they are constantly administered. In summer 2017, I read about a study Dr. Karsten Bonneman was doing at the National Institutes of Health. An article had been published in the Washington Post outlining many of the symptoms Charlotte presented with. As a former HHS employee, I had no qualms about picking up the phone and calling NIH. Char ended up at the clinical center in September of 2017 when she was 15 months old. My husband, a veteran warfighter who spent a couple of years on the front lines in Iraq, almost beat up the phlebotomist who tried to dig around in Char's tiny little arm for some blood. The researcher who examined Charlotte in the clinical center said, great news, her muscles are fine. She doesn't have the disorder we're researching. It is clear something's wrong though. It's a brain body connection issue, but that wasn't what they were studying. So much to the chagrin of the medical geneticist at Children's National we've just been referred to, NIH never completed the sequencing of Charlotte's genome. In December 2017, due to Charlotte's significantly elevated levels of an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase, Children's National performed tests to make sure Charlotte didn't have a condition called Mabray syndrome. We went in on a Friday for a wrist x-ray and anxiously waited for the results because, of course, we Googled it, even though they told us not to. In March 2018, they sedated Charlotte to do an MRI of her brain and check her hearing. Charlotte's hearing was fine, but her brain was not. Part of her brain was underdeveloped, and she had delayed development of the white matter in her brain, making it difficult for her brain to communicate with her body. I called Children's National in tears, trying to see if someone could explain the emailed results to us as we didn't have an assigned neurologist. In May 2018, realizing that whatever Charlotte had wasn't going to be something common, I decided to go back to full-time work, assisting the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases with transitioning their headquarters from California to D.C. This introduced me to the incredibly welcoming, diverse, passionate, and often desperate 30 million strong rare disease community. In 2018, Children's National did a chromosomal test and ruled out another ultra-rare disease called 1P36 deletion syndrome. Finally, in September 2018, our medical geneticists recommended exploratory exome sequencing, emphasizing that we may not obtain a diagnosis from it. Every Life's founder, Dr. Emil Kakis, tried to reassure me. If we couldn't get an answer, we could do what Dr. Matt Might had done to find his son Bertrand's NGLY1 mutation, comb through the DNA sequence ourselves, and find the anomaly. My husband and I worried about whether what Charlotte had was degenerative or if a treatment might exist. As we remained in a state of anxiety, our world-class medical geneticist at Children's National spent an inordinate amount of time writing letters to our insurance company asking for coverage for sequencing instead of practicing medicine. Despite having a platinum insurance plan, our clinician's request for a whole exome sequencing was denied. It was deemed experimental. This is not unfortunately uncommon. We moved forward and in December 2018, whole exome sequencing gave us an answer. Charlotte has a de novo heterozygous mutation. 
a random mutation that occurs before a baby is born. One base pair in her DNA was changed, resulting in a single amino acid change. Instead of alanine, her body produces serine, impacting the protein structure of an enzyme and resulting in NAA10-related disorder. While there's no treatment for NA10, our diagnosis allowed us to connect with Charlotte's researcher, Dr. Golson Lyon, who is now the principal investigator for an NIH-funded natural history study, which is the first step to try and find a treatment for these disorders. The NA10 gene encodes for an enzyme that is responsible for the acetylation of an estimated 40 to 50% of all human proteins. Since about half of the proteins in their bodies don't go through this necessary last step of production, the issues our NA10 girls face are systemic. Their brains are not processing appropriately, and many have significant comorbidities, including epilepsy, cardiomyopathies, and ocular manifestations, including blindness. While Shar escaped the most severe of these comorbidities, her level of functioning remains that of a toddler. At five, she can walk, but cannot take a step up or down without assistance. She is nonverbal and not potty trained, but she is one of the sweetest, happiest little people you'll ever meet. Despite having spent my career working with scientists and clinicians, having access to world-class doctors, and living two blocks from the NIH, obtaining a diagnosis took over a year. When I told then NCATS director, Dr. Chris Austin, about the time and doggedness it took, he laughed and said, Christina, that's the fastest diagnosis I've ever heard of. Tragically, it takes rare disease patients an average of five to seven years to receive an accurate diagnosis. This lengthy diagnostic odyssey results in significant physical, emotional, and financial hardship for patients and their families. Children with undiagnosed conditions suffer high rates of debilitating symptoms and have a greater chance of early death from delayed clinical care, therapy, and treatment when it exists. Timely and sustainable access to diagnostic testing that rapidly informs appropriate patient care and treatments is fundamental to rare disease patients' health and well-being. Even if no FDA-approved treatment exists, a diagnosis allows patients to better manage the symptoms of their disease or disorder by receiving referrals to critical therapies, including physical, occupational, and speech therapies. They can enroll in clinical trials, build connections with their specific disease communities, and ultimately contribute to the understanding of the natural history of the disease, including the magnitude and diversity of the impacted patient population. Our family achieved a diagnosis because of DNA sequencing. Despite all our economic, educational, and professional advantages, it was still an enormous effort. For most people, access to sequencing and potential diagnosis is simply beyond reach. We frequently hear in the media that the cost of sequencing tests are down to $1,000 or less. It's important to remember that this reflects only the cost to run the test in the lab and does not include the cost of analysis and interpretation, confirmatory testing, and overhead. At the end of the day, the current cost to the patient or payer totals thousands of dollars. Currently, three bills are in Congress that would require state Medicaid programs to provide coverage for genomic sequencing to help families and children end their diagnostic odysseys. I hope the sponsors of these bills, Senators Collins, Kelly, and Menendez, and Congressman Swalwell and Peters, will come together to make certain the final language in these bills ensures coverage for all DNA sequencing clinical services. There are three types of sequencing tests used by clinicians today. The genomic sequence of an individual's DNA can be captured and examined in whole or in part. Variations in a genome that scientists look for can range from a change in a base pair in one place of the sequence to larger regional changes, deletions, or repeats. Fundamentally, whole genome sequencing tests look at almost all the patient's genome at a relatively low depth, while whole exome sequencing tests primarily examine the sections that code for proteins at a medium depth. Panel tests observe specific genes or other regions of the DNA at the highest depth with a focus on certain conditions or health issues. Several states and hospitals have instituted demonstration projects to provide rapid whole genome sequencing for babies in the NICU. These pilots are great first steps and have demonstrated that access to sequencing can get parents answers faster and provide better care to these babies. I urge us all to run with these successes and ensure that families in all states, at all stages of their diagnostic journeys, can access the same care. When the final legislation is enacted, the language must require state Medicaid programs to cover all current and future DNA sequencing clinical services to help diagnose individuals, especially children, and give them access to the care they need sooner. 
Our expert clinicians must be empowered to select whatever diagnostic sequencing technology is best suited for their individual patients to accurately diagnose and, if possible, treat them. Thank you, Research America, for having me speak today. I look forward to working with you to ensure all patients have access to timely and sustainable diagnostic testing.